Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our inaugural MVP Con. We are bringing you some of the best and most celebrated names in comics, film, television, and music to give service members and their families and our wider military community the opportunity to interact with fan favorites and to round out day one of this great event. We have television host of Forged in Fire, martial arts expert and weapons expert, Doug Marqueda. Doug, thank you so much for being with me, my man. Hello, everybody. Welcome from The Forge. Doug Marqueda here. And hi, Chris. And hello, everyone. Hello, everyone out there. I'd like to welcome to the studio where I get to be out here actually alone for the first time. Nobody here but the Georges, my test dummies. How's everybody doing? <laughs> That's so great that you actually name your test dummies. Do they know what they're in for, these Georges? They're, they're there to test out all the amazing weaponry that you guys create on Forged and Fire. Absolutely. Well, I don't know. They're, they're, they're great. They're resilient, like our military. They always come back for more. They don't ever complain, and they keep me company. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, I want to remind everybody that is joining us for my conversation with Doug that you can get in on it. You can ask Doug a question if you'd like. Simply use the uh, Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Just type in what your question is, and I will try to relay as many of those as possible. Doug, you got a lot of people joining us on this. Your show is obviously hugely popular with the greater population, but certainly with our military community. What's the experience like been for you hosting Forged in Fire? Well, I am one of the judges, so we, I'm not a host on the show, but the experience, come on. Who, who doesn't love fire, sparks? sharp weapons. I get to run around with sharp edges and everything else. It's, it's been a blessing um, only because um, it's the community of blade making to be literate with your hands again. And that's something that I love to be part of because so many times in this digital age, people forget what built America, what built us. We build things with our hands. And this particular show is all about building, having an idea, having a dream, and then building it and make it a reality and then functional. And uh, in our terms, it's all about weaponry. You know, I had a chance to watch your YouTube video. Uh, you essentially gave us a tour of your knife collection. Most of those that you designed, I mean, that's so cool. Your, your mastery of knives and the weapons that you were displaying is just amazing. Your, the dexterity of your hands and when you were handling those blades was just astounding to me. Well, I was lucky enough to uh, have a great passion, in, which is martial arts and Kali but it was weapons based. And I call it my cycle of knife, like cycle of life. And what it is, is I learned about the weapon. I learned about the knife, how to use it, how to defend against it. Then I got to learn how to design it so that whatever I've learned, I want to actually use it with something in design. Now with Forge and Fire, I actually learned how it's created. My designs are production blades, but learning how it's forged is so ancient and it transcends all races, all cultures. So it's, you know, part of our history, part, it's in our DNA, I think, that uh, we know about weapons from all the way from all, from, from when man first realized that they are holding a tool. And, uh, you know, as we progress, it turned into that. So that's my cycle of life. <laughs> I guess there's certain um, basics of a weapon like a knife that haven't changed throughout the history of time. I mean, the furthest tools that they've discovered have always kind of been rudimentarily the same. Handle sharp object you got it if you got an edge it should cut if it's got a point it should be able to puncture um and all these different things are the attributes you know of, of weaponry you know doug we got a lot of people who would like to speak to you so we're going to go to our first live location right now at the u.s office in yokota japan yokota if you could uh start your video and join doug and i we would love to see your smiling faces there they are how you doing my man good to see you Hey, good to see you guys. What's your name and what is your question for Doug? Hey, my, my name is Luke Smelter, and I just got a quick question. Uh, so my buddy, he's getting ready to transition out of the military, and he's actually looking, uh, he loves the show, so he's looking to start his own uh, knife forging business. He's got, you know, half the details scheduled out, so just, uh, just wondering if you got any advice I can pass on to him. Absolutely. The first thing you do with about knife making is learn how to do a knife, and don't be afraid about not knowing how to do it educate yourself. And in this time, 
It's all over the internet how to do that. Of course, Jay Nielsen wanted to just say, buy my DVDs, but educate yourself and then try it. Knife making is about getting the experience of doing it and creating it, and you get better by trying and failing and trying and failing, and there's nothing in that because through trial and failure, you're actually gonna succeed. So don't be afraid to do it. I know people think of bladesmiths as these burly men and blacksmiths and everything. No, we got machines for everything else. And a lot of our new contestants here are people who do it as a hobby. So it doesn't take long to learn it. You just got to learn it. And once you learn it, you develop confidence because you learn how to do it. You learn the ins and outs and you realize, oh, I can do this. Because we have bladesmiths from the, the youngest I saw was actually six years old, but his dad was helping him out, all the way to 70 years old making blades. So everybody should be able to do this. They can do it. And I've seen it. So just tell them, just do it. And hey, we appreciate, awesome. appreciate you. Appreciate you. Appreciate your question. Thank you for joining us, man, and especially thank you for your service. Is there somebody else there that uh, would like to ask a question? I saw somebody hey. look in the background there with a USO shirt. <laughs> there he is. Uh, oh, there she is. How you doing? Thank you. Hi, how are you doing? Really good. What's your name and what is your question for Doug? Uh, my name is Alex. I'm also here at Yakota. My question is, I heard that you were prior military. Uh, yes, what I branch were you and what did you do? Okay, I was in the I was in the Air Force for eight years. I first started out in logistics. <laughs> Aim high. <laughs> but I was in logistics. I did a base supply for my first four years. Then I cross trained into cardiopulmonary, getting into the medical field, and um, I did that uh, till I got out. I really loved it. It was one of the best experiences of my life, and everything I learned through the military, I attribute to where I am today, and what I've been able to do. I assume from your reaction uh, to Air Force that you yourself are, are in the Air Force? I am. I am a labor and delivery nurse in the Air Force. So I'm also nice. Very cool. That's nice. great. That's great. Essential. You're, you're twice an essential worker. You're in the military yeah. and you're also a delivery nurse. That's fantastic. How long have you been stationed over there? A uh, year and a half. That's great. And there are a lot of people who watched Forged in Fire over there at Yakota? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> excellent hey alex we appreciate your question thank you very much uh for joining us and thank you for your service appreciate what you do for us thank you, guys you. Stay safe over there thank you doug so you say that your uh your training was both martial arts but with uh, an eye towards weaponry so what came first for you was it the love of martial arts or was it the love of weapons ah uh, good question it was the love of martial arts um troubled childhood so uh, my father finally had me take martial arts to discipline me because they, he was thinking, okay, you're getting into the uh, high school age. And in the, in the Philippines, people carry weapons. They don't fight fairly. So I had to learn martial arts to defend myself. But instead of becoming aggressive with it, it actually calmed me down. I thought I was going to get into it so I could kick more ass, you know, and all that. And no, it actually calmed me down. But my greatest fear was always weapons because I had an incident where I faced a knife and I froze and I was afraid of that. But as I joined the Air Force, when I was in the military, I wanted to get back into martial arts. I actually met an instructor over there, or my buddy rather, who taught me about weaponry. And I thought, and, we, and this was, he did not have a weapon with him. We were kickboxing each other. He was throwing me everywhere. And I got up and I'm like, okay, let me try it again. So I go, wow, this is cool. What's this, Aikido? Or what's this? And he goes, no, it's Kali. I go, never heard of Kali. Oh, Arnis. Wait, I'm Filipino. I know what Arnis is. He goes, no. It's a weapons art. And then I learned it and I fell in love with it. Wow. I faced my fear. And that was an awesome thing. I faced my fear and I learned so much about myself by getting into the weapon arts. Well, and that's a great lesson for anybody is facing your fear and overcoming that fear in the process of facing it. So kudos to you, Doug, for doing this. Let me get to a couple questions that are in the Q&A box. Belinda Barron, uh, she's got a couple questions. The first is, was there a particular military weapon that you love to test? A particular military weapon that I love to test? By, in terms of military, um, what exactly are we talking about? I'm, the weaponry that we have are all used by, when we say military, we have these up here, which are actually the services that we have. Air Force, you have your Navy, you have the Marines, and the Army, which are the Sabres. Uh, if we're going to talk about the military weapons, I really enjoy using, <laughs> I loved the army uh, saber that we have there because this was the battle of the services. 
sorry, Coast Guard, next time. But uh, we only had room for four, and I really enjoyed testing out the Army uh, weapon because of the way it was made, and the way it flowed, and the way it cut with it. So I really enjoyed that. And he, by the way, he ended up winning the tournament. But um, in terms of our service military weapons, I enjoyed the Army's weapon right there. Well, Belinda would like to say thank you so much, and uh, she appreciates your positivity that you bring to the show, especially in times like these. It is very needed. She is based, uh, um, actually, uh, it doesn't say where she's based. She is uh, Army National Guard. But uh, more importantly, Doug, she would like to hear you say your famous, it will kill line, or even just how you say it. Your weapon? It will kill. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Belinda. Hope you enjoyed that. And thank you very much for your question. I appreciate uh, you joining us here today. Uh, all right, let's go to Donald Munez. He says, hello from El Paso, Texas. Hey. What teachers of Filipino martial arts did you study with? All right. So actually, Donald, um, I was stationed close by. I was in Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico. And one of my first teachers in Cali when I started was Gaudiosa Ruby of Comjuca Cali right there in El Paso. So there you go. That's the first start I got over that. But once I got uh, stationed in other places, I had to actually start with um, Edgar Solite from Lomeco and Leo Gaje and uh, June De Leon. I just traveled the world to learn from different instructors because that to me is what completes me. I've learned different martial arts, different systems from different people because that's the only way you're going to learn your weaknesses and your strengths. Very cool. All right, Crystal Ballou, I hope I'm pronouncing that last name correctly. She, like, she would like to know how important is it for you to bring the historical content into the weapons development? It's important because we try to educate you know, the audience. We try to educate. The show is about making a blade, but we also add the uh, element that these are iconic weapons made throughout history. So because of that, you learn to find out how was this made, or at least make you research into this particular culture, this particular people. And then when we see their weapons, you go, okay, based on what we know, how does it work? How well can it do its heel test? How well can it do its sharpness and strength test? But when we do these different weapons from different cultures, we get a chance to also talk about them. And that's what I love about because it's also educational about, of course, history. Well, that's a great answer, Doug. And that leads to a very nice follow-up question from Lindsay Powell, who asks, which historical weapon that the contestants have made in the final round has been your favorite so far? There is one particular weapon, a uh, Chattel, that was made by a master smith. Um, and um, <laughs> it was one of the wildest swords made because number one, he did a great job. But when I wielded that weapon, it made a sound through the air because it was so sharp, it was singing. And that was by, uh, um, oh, he's gonna kill me. But he was one of our champions. He actually beat one of our judges. But um, that Chotel blade, that was a curved blade, uh, was one of the ones that really made an impact on me because when I wielded that, and when I cut through a side of beef, it was so sharp, I actually had to stop myself because it cut like butter all the way through and I almost hit the floor. That's how sharp it was. Oh my gosh, that's so that will always be embedded in my, my head. All right, Bert Foster, to... there you go, before he kills me. It was made by Bert Foster. Bert Foster, all right, getting some credit there. Uh, Doug, I, I, wanna, I wanna just end this small section of Q&A with something that is actually coming from an account that bears your name. Douglas Marqueda, so I think you might uh, realize this is a trick question. Which of your three sons is your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my boy, my devil dog, Lance Corporal Marqueda. Uh, my favorite son, the one that I love the most, my sons. <laughs> tricky, uh, tricky. You, uh, you knew that answer was coming. You knew I knew, I knew. Uh, I'm so proud of him that he's part of my family, uh, in the family of service members. I've got a Marine, I've got a first responder, Alex, and my youngest, Jaden, and all my boys are so, I'm so proud of them because hopefully that they, was, they obviously, my devil dog joined the Marines, not the Air Force, but nonetheless, he's doing great. So proud of him. So proud. That's fantastic. Well, that congratulations to you on uh, having that, that strong family, Doug. That's very, very cool. All right, let's get to our second live location. This is also in Japan. This is in Okinawa. And I know we have some fans waiting there to ask you some questions as well, Doug. So if we can have Okinawa join us right now. There they are. 
How you doing? Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. How's it going, Doug? Big fans of the show and big fans of you. And uh, thanks for everything you guys do. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Chris Hosvick. This is my wife, Johanna Carlson. We're both uh, nurses here in Okinawa. So Great, thank you. For We're Navy, you. not Air Force, but we still appreciate all big, the brands. Same family. <laughs> we appreciate you guys. What is your question for Doug? So I'm really curious about what it's like on the set. I see some of the guys, they get so hot and worked up. Is it that hot for you guys or are you far enough away? What, what's the atmosphere? So here's kind of like the distance of where we are. That's our table and that's where the forges are. It gets hot in here because we have four forges that are running and we have the vents and everything. We have AC running, but when, when it gets really hot, I mean, it's very hard for them because some of them stand in between the forges. And we tell them, don't do that. You know, get away from the forge while it's heating up. But you have to also understand this, the pressure of the clock that's up there, the pressure of beating on working and everything else, plus the heat and everything gets to you. It's not just the heat, it does get hot in here, but they take breaks, we have fans and everything else. But I think a lot of it also is the pressure gets to them. And that just adds to the fatigue that they're doing as well as the temperature as it rises. It probably doesn't help with uh, pretty boy Will Willis shouting out to them every uh, time check either, right? You bet. We're always reminding <laughs> you. You only have so much time. And you just look up and they're like, all right, we heard you. We know there's a big clock in there. But that actually gets to your head. That clock is, 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 people don't understand that when it's competition mode, everything you do, no, you will forget sometimes. We call it uh, competition amnesia and it happens. Right. Hey, Doug, I got a question about the crambit. I know you like crambits a lot, and um, a buddy of mine gave me a crambit about the size of a velociraptor's talon. It's way too big. What's a good recommendation from you for a good carry length? I know a couple of my cop buddies back in Coronado and in San Diego. Shout out to the police. Um, there you go. Uh, what's a good length that you would recommend for a daily carry? A daily carry for a karambit, well, actually, if it's a daily carry, then you want something that is at least um, that you're able to fold and keep small. Karambits really, by nature, are small blades. They're really supposed to be small enough to use this way. Uh, the big blades are pretty much modern te technology or modern ways of thinking bigger is better. But karambits are actually small push daggers like a claw. That's what people, so they created that. What I love about it though is the ring feature because you can do this. Oh, it didn't fall. I still have retention of that. You have the fix in the folder. But uh, these are coming out soon with 5.11 plug there. But nonetheless, a karabit is all about the retention of the ring. So find one that fits your hand. And the blade is all about depending on what you're comfortable with. If you want to carry a fixed blade, you can go bigger or longer. And if you want a small one, they're usually easier to be found on folders. Jack, thank you. Hey, thanks. I don't you want to take up all your time, yeah, but ahead. I am curious, how is your shoulder? I know, I know this isn't all fun and games. Injuries happen. How are you recovering? Thank you very much. I am doing great. I'm back to swinging again. I had a great doctor. Uh, I ripped my rotator cuff. Uh, common in sport injury, though, but I'm back and swinging. So thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, we appreciate you guys joining us. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else there at the uh, USO office that would like to ask Doug a question, or were you guys the only ones? We hogged all the time. <laughs> that is okay. We don't mind you guys hogging the time. You ask great questions, and we thank you very, very much for uh, keeping us safe here in the U.S. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Right on. Thank, thank you. you. Doug, it's so cool that you're giving us a little impromptu tour of the Forged in Fire set as we're going along here. I, I, love, uh, I love seeing all the stuff in the background. Could you, could you walk us around a little bit more and show us yes, uh, some sure. parts of the set? Absolutely. So this is where it starts. These are where the real stars of the show begin. The anvil and the forges right behind them. So this is where our contestants come in. That's where they create their magic. And then when we reveal whatever they're going to be using from here, they take that and put it into the forge. These are gas operated and the forge pretty much get it very hot. Once you get it all hot, now we can move that metal. We go and you have the choices of setting it on your anvil with a hammer or a press, a hydraulic press that presses and squeezes together so that you can get start, you know, moving your, your uh, billets together, you know, expanding your billets and everything else, set the welds. Or we have a power hammer called Big Blue. And Big Blue can be very gentle or very hard, but it does that. And of course you have the hammer. So 
the, this is the initial step of what you're doing in uh, forging. Once you have the shape drawn out of your blade by hammering and pressing, then you can go to the grinder. And the grinder helps put in or clean up your blade and everything else. You're doing that. When you clean it up, you can at least have the shape, get the bevels in there, clean it up. And then, of course, the big magic is where we dunk in, if you preheat your weapon, thermocycle, make it strong, we dunk it in oil to cool it, and that's the quench. The heart and soul of the blade is in its quench, so that's what gives it strength. And then off camera, after that, we actually temper it because the blade is hard, but it's brittle. Off camera, we start to temper it so it doesn't, it takes the brittleness away. And then of course, second round, we come out here and we actually do a lot of the uh, handle making material because handles are what connects the end user to the blade. If I can't pick up anything, who cares how good the blade is? And this is our pantry of all the different materials we use to put the handles on from natural materials to synthetics. And then once the blade is complete, we get to test it. We get to test it for first sharpness. Of course, well, well, we call it the uh, strength test because we want to know that your blade is strong. And then for sharpness. Now, if we're doing kill tests, it's different. These guys are the ones who receive the kill test. That's what you go. We got ballistics gel here. So this is Jelly George when he's full in ballistics. <laughs> when his uh, ballistic gel falls off, he becomes George Bones. And we have the other Georges here that are foam that we also use when they want to be play dress up, I guess. And that's a forge. I love seeing the behind the scenes. And just a quick question going back to the first step of the process. Do the judges care whether or not the contestant uses the anvil or the press or one more than other? Because obviously the anvil is a, is a much more historic way to make your blade. Um, no, because it's a competition thing. Sometimes when you're in a competition, you have to go with what you don't do at home. You go, it's quicker this way. You only have three hours to make a blade. So you have to use what's provided to you. Now, sometimes we have challenges where we take away the power hammers, we take away the presses, and they have to go old school too. So a little bit of everything. We, 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 to be a, a contestant here, you should at least watch the show and look at all the challenges that we do. So at least you learn somehow, some way to do all these challenges on your own. Challenging indeed. That's great that you put the contestants through their paces. Hey, Doug, we got a question from a young fan for you. This is from Balin Hirschman. He is 10 years old, and he would like to know what your favorite memory is judging the show. My favorite memory judging the show? Um, <laughs> I guess the time when I got to actually bring out the karambit, talk about it, and I flipped it, demonstrated it, and showed it how it's used and that freaked out Dave Baker. <laughs> Only because it was a trainer, but at the same time, it, it was something that I do, something that they said, hey Doug, since this is what you love to do, we're gonna do an episode for you to do that. And I got to demonstrate what I do with the Karam bit. So that will always, you know, to me, that was like, that was like uh, the network saying, okay, we'll give in to you. And then here's something you love, we'll do it for you. So that was nice of them to do that. All right, Sarah Clapper would like to know, what is your favorite weapon from history? And that I think is a favorite from weapon. Russell. So maybe he's using his wife's account, but Russell and Sarah Clapper would like to know, what is your favorite weapon from history? My favorite weapon from history is my mind. <laughs> that is my favorite weapon. Everything else is just a tool. It doesn't matter what's in your hand. What matters is what you do with it. That's why you educate yourself with the attributes of weapons so that whatever you pick up, you can use, you can wield. People think in the beginning, it's all about what you're wielding in your hands. No, it's how you use it that's important. So I really develop it to be that way. I'm not being facetious, I'm being honest. That's exactly what weaponry is all about. It's not the design of it, it's how you use it and put it into play to make it functional. History has come up with, you know, if it's all about the weapon, then why do we have so many designs, so many designs of weaponry? Why not stick with one that works? Because it's not about the knife, it's about the culture, the people, and how you lived. If you understood that, then you can create the weapon based on how do I defeat them based on their defense or based on what they're wearing and based on the technology that they have. And to be able to do that, you have to have a sharp mind. Hmm, so that matches. <laughs> important distinction to make too, uh, Doug, between a weapon and a tool. And I love the fact that your favorite weapon from history is your mind, because that's something that you can do the most harm and the most good with simultaneously. Absolutely. 
Uh, Kevin Schuler says, Doug, thank you for what you do. Uh, and uh, Crystal Bilyeu would like to say that she is stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky with her husband, Chad, and they just want to thank you for your service. Oh, uh, no, the thanks uh, goes thank out to you guys. I mean, well, th oh, service, th thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Pulley checking in as well, Doug, saying hello from Iwakuni, Japan. Uh, the question is, as far as weapons-based martial arts goes, what is your preferred weapon of choice? Um, well, my preferred weapon of choice is, I guess, you know, aside from the mine, if I have to pick up a tool, um, a karambit works for me in close quarters because of the retention. I just like the feel of the retention. The blade itself can be designed anyways. There are straight karambits, there are curved karambits and everything else, but that's my preferred thing simply because um, I'm able to do a lot of things with my hands. I'm able to pick up things uh, with, a, with a knife. So if you have a knife in your hand, you're limited to what you can do with that. With a karambit, you're able to actually do more. Uh, if I may demonstrate here real quick. So I have a karambit in here, but I can also pick up this and stay safe. It's a hand sanitizer. But you see how I can do all that and still have and still maintain the karambit in my hand. So that's my preferred thing because of retention and to do a lot of things. Not just, you know, be tied to having that weapon in the hand. Because in combat and stress uh, situations, the knife does fall down a lot. Yeah, things get slippery, things get knocked around, and having that karambit hook around your finger, obviously you're not going to let go of the knife. So that's a great point to make. Uh, Kelly Buner would like to know how old you were when you started martial arts training. Um, the actual journey, when I was young, I'd say about... 10 years old, I started uh, classical martial arts like Taekwondo, kickboxing. Um, but the weaponry part of Kali, I didn't start till I was 25. So that's when I started my journey. You're never too old to start anything. Passion is forever till you die. And one of the things I love about my weapons arts is that I have grandmasters in their 80s who are doing this. As a matter of fact, my oldest student is 82 years old. Wow. During the COVID time, I trained my father-in-law, and I'll be releasing videos on my YouTube channel, Instagram, of how he was able to learn it. A guy who's never picked up a weapon, who's had two shoulder, in, two shoulder replacement and two knee replacements, learned Kali in three months, simply because he had the passion to want to learn something. So as long as you have that, you can do anything. That's what it takes is that passion. That's a great story, Doug. Thank you for sharing that. Now, I understand that on the show, sometimes a blacksmith's weapon will be broken. And sometimes the blacksmith's weapon is broken by you. Alexander Zercher <laughs> would like to know, do you ever feel bad about that? I always feel bad when a weapon is broken, only because this. I know what it took for them to put it together. You see, the forge is like life. We, we give you an idea. I've got an idea of my child. We give you the materials to create it and you put it into the forge. That's like putting it into a womb. Then what comes out of that you beat it and you put it through fire just like life makes you stronger and harder. And, 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 and eventually when you're done in your form, just like life does that to you, you present it to the world. We present it to the judges. And what do the judges do? They test it and destroy it. It's like, you're killing my kid. <laughs> but in the end, I, I feel bad because to me, I know what went into that. And though, despite the fact that they put all their time, if it breaks, uh, I feel like, you know, well, you put your heart and soul into it, but unfortunately, uh, this what happened, and I, I feel for that. But at the same time, it is a competition show, and we are expected that the best blade will win. Uh, Doug Lindsay Powell checking in with us, and uh, she wants to know something that's probably gets asked a lot. Why did the show change from the dummies being filled with blue dye to red dye? Um, well, the Smurfs were complaining. They were figuring that you're using the, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess we were allowed to go with, with red dye and um, they decided to use that instead. A little bit more realistic. <laughs> well, Sarah Clapper checked back in to say that Russell is eight years old. He asked that question a couple questions ago. So Russell, thank you very much for uh, joining us and thank you for being a fan. And thank you, Sarah, for, uh, checking back in with us and letting us know about that. So the age of the lowest fan so far has been lowered now to eight years old. I love it. Gotta love the- One of the things I love about the show is this family show. A lot of the fans 
are, are people who, who watch it with their families from father, son, daughters, and everything else. It's something they sit down together and they get to watch something together. And I'm so uh, honored that we have a show that's a family show. Yeah, that's really cool and really important. And you guys do a great job at it. Uh, Lauren Luce would like to know, says, uh, hi, Doug. Stationed in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and it's uh, Dustin, I guess. So maybe another uh, guy using his wife's account. I, know I never have clarification on these, so I, I just got to put this out there. It says, stationed in Minneapolis, Minnesota, also in transportation in the Air Force. Question is, I know you have a passion for martial arts, and I'm curious if you are still doing any training in the military as a contractor, and if you started doing instruction while you were in the military. No, I didn't get. I didn't start my instruction for uh, contracting in in the, in the combatives till I got out. So this was a passion started in the military. When I got out, I was in the medical field. That's what I did for a living, and I loved it too. Um, but I maintained my passion and trained all the time. What had happened was a lot of my students were actually people in the field of instruction. I had defensive tactics instructors in law enforcement, and my military guy became a contractor. So they pulled me and go listen. We have a need for this. Would you create a program for us to teach these units? And that's how I got in. So I didn't do it till I actually got out of the military and I started doing seminars everywhere. It just so happens that my students were instructors and they brought me into the world. Very cool. All right, a question from a military spouse here. Melody, Melanie Benton says, I'm a huge fan of you, Doug, and retired EMT and respiratory technician married to a retired UASF E8 SMSGT. Uh, Doug, what is your most favorite knife to make and craft with Damascus steel? Well, if I had to, like I'm saying, I'm a designer of a knife rather than an actual forger. But Damascus steel just brings out the beauty of any blade that you make. But I'd say I've, I've really enjoyed the kukris because it's very curvaceous. It's very functional. And uh, the design that uh, Jason Knight has created is really beautiful as a kukri and very functional. And you put that, that in Damascus, oh, it's a beautiful piece of work. Doug, we have someone from Texas checking in with us. This is Brian from Texas. He'd like to know, have any of the judges taught you how to forge? Yes, Jay Nielsen actually taught Will and I to forge. So we went to, uh, on our time off, we actually went to his home and uh, in his forge studio and we got in there and uh, he taught us how to forge. So we had a chance to make a blade there. Um, Jason Knight, another j former judge of the show, has actually also um, invited me to come over eventually and start forging with him too. Very cool. There's another uh, technical question on the show or a logistical question, I guess. Kevin Baxley would like to know, are both rounds of forging on the show done right after the other one or is there a break in between the rounds? There is a break in between the rounds um, in TV land. Of course, it seems that it's continuous, but in reality, no, we, we're not that mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Robert Nolan is from Washington, D.C. Says, Doug, I have trained with you at your seminars, which were very insightful. Do you have any plans to write a book? A book? Um, uh, well, it's in the works where I'm actually uh, starting to put a lot of my stuff on video. I don't know if I'll be writing a book for that, but I will be putting the curriculums on video. There you go. So we're going modern with that. We're not going to, we're going to go mm -hmm. <laughs> digital video, not tactile paper. Hope uh, you're going to be watching that one. Uh, Karsten Hole says, greetings from Germany. How much preparation and revision time does, it does an episode take? Um, well, it, there's a lot of preparation just to make it happen because we have Smiths coming from everywhere and we have, you know, probably about four days worth of shooting to make one episode happen because they do have to, uh, once they're done with the first two rounds and they're sent home, we start another episode. And then once they're done with their uh, blade making, which is four days, usually four days at home, they come back and then we do finals with them. Kristen Bello with another question here. She said that her husband, Chad, and uh, she, Crystal, are from Fort Knox, Kentucky, and they're wondering why oil is used in the quenching process. Um, it's one of the faster ones to quench um, when you're able to cool it down. So the oil is viscous. Um, if you, you, we, it's easier also to keep in here. Um, so when we use the oil, it cools it rapidly, 
as compared to brine or water or other substances. And it's one of the ones that um, the judges, actually our technical judges over here have decided to have for the, for the, uh, for the competitions. Uh, one second, I... There we go. I there we go. This just allowed me to unmute myself. They're, they're bringing me along very slowly here. I'm not allowed to use all the buttons. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that they can trust me to do that. All right, Lori Hines would like to know, do you have advice for a first time bladesmith, someone who has never picked up a hammer or steel before? Um, the first thing is do not be discouraged in the beginning. Learn to make all the mistakes off the bat. That's really how to enjoy something. Do it with the eyes of a child when they're first doing something. I don't care about the rules. I just want to have fun. When you start out having fun, starting out this, this, uh, this new adventure or passion, you'll always win. Because even if you don't make the best knife, I had fun. That's one of the things that I, I wish people would not just go for perfection immediately. That's an adult mindset. A child's mindset is, I'm going to have fun with this. And because I had fun, I'll keep on doing it, keep on doing it, do, keep on doing it. And in so doing, when you're having fun, you start to want to find better ways to do it while having fun. I want to learn this from this person. I want to learn this technique. I want to learn all that. But because it's a fun thing, you'll continue doing it. If you're looking for perfection right away in the beginning, you could get frustrated and then give it up. So don't do that. Make it fun for yourself. Make it fun and stick to it. That's great advice. All right, Doug, Devane's Brown is stationed in Las Vegas at Nellis Air Force Base and says, thank you for what you guys do. And would also like to know, uh, will you guys ever do an episode to have them create weapons from anime or video games? Um, right now, we're sticking to a lot of historical weapons. Um, there might be an episode that we've done, but it, it hasn't been brought up yet to do something like that because we're trying to bring out iconic weapons from history. Not to say that it'll never happen, you know, but a lot of times when we, we even try to get some uh, weapons from movies, but that comes with a lot of licensing issues. So right now we're sticking with historical weapons, but you never know. <laughs> All right, Doug, the, uh, the lowest age fan has been reset once again. We've got a message here from Lillian Hirschman, who says that Forged in Fire is really great, and I love watching with my brother. Thank you. So she's got an eight-year-old brother. She's six. They love watching Forged in Fire together, so you should be very happy about that. Very, very cool. Thank hey, you, uh, Doug, it's been such a blast chatting with you. I really had a great time doing my research on you and watching your YouTube channel. I, I highly... Uh, recommend everyone checking out Doug's YouTube channel. Uh, thank you, Doug, for your service. We appreciate what you do. And I'd like to give you a few minutes to offer some words of encouragement to everyone who is joining us from around the world, including Hawaii, Maryland, California, Texas, New York, Japan, North Carolina, Ohio, Minnesota, Florida, Qatar, Virginia, Germany, Colorado, Arizona, Alabama, Arkansas, Alaska, and New Mexico. First up, this is such an honor um, that uh, you're allowing me to share this with service members, veterans all out there. Just my heartfelt thank you. As a former service member, as a veteran, I understand the things that you're doing for our country, the things of service that you're doing, the sacrifice you're doing, I understand that. As a parent of a Marine, I understand what, how families have to support those that go away so that you're protecting the freedoms so that we can live the way we do. And it's a heartfelt thank you to all of you that do that and to the families that support them. Because without their support, what are we fighting for? You are doing a very important thing and a sacrifice so that the rest of us here living out here doing what we're doing can do so. And without you guys doing what you're doing, we can't continue to do this. So you are not forgotten. You are not, you know, um, everything that you're doing, we're, we're out here and always with thanks. My big support for everything that you do because I was once there and now from here, I thank you for allowing me to look back and say thank you for your service. And a shout out to my devil dog, DJ, and my Alex, who's a first responder, and Jaden. Love you guys. And they tied. They tied in the who's my favorite con son uh, category. So congratulations to your three sons. They're all number one in your heart, as they should be. Doug Marqueda, cannot thank you enough for joining us here. On my U pleasure. Um, Everyone look forward to the new season of Forged and Fire, which is actually in production right now. So good luck 
Doug along the way with that. And thank you very much for joining us here on day one thank of you, Wes. Con. It's been a wonderful day. And if you'd like to see the lineup for the next couple of days, all you got to do is go to uso.org slash MVP and all the information is there for you. Doug, thanks again. Thank Let's you.